Whoa, look at the colors on that fish. Being down here never gets old. <laughs> I hope you're ready to have the time of your life. Well, as much as you could have the time of your life sitting inside. But you're in luck. I'm starting out on an undersea expedition and you're positively, absolutely invited. Follow me. We're going to explore coral reefs today. I've visited coral reefs all around the world, but the reefs at home, here in the Bahamas, are my favorite. You can see for yourself that coral reefs are found in the tropics. This is because they require warm, clear, shallow water. The world's reefs fit into three major regions. The Indo-Pacific, the Red Sea, and the Western Atlantic. Let's hop on over to the Indo-Pacific. We're in Australia, blokes. <laughs> now, this here is a biggie. The Great Barrier Reef along the northeast coast of Australia. It is the world's longest barrier reef and is twice as long as the entire Bahamas. We can't begin to count the number of species that call the Great Barrier Reef home. Let's see if you were paying attention in geography class. Where do you suppose the coral reefs in the Bahamas are found? There's no doubt about it, the Western Atlantic region. With its tropical climate and clear warm water, the Caribbean is an ideal place for coral reefs. A third of this region's reefs are found in the Bahamas. Okay, do you recognize this? Here we are on the third longest barrier reef in the world. And guess where it's found? Right here in the Bahamas, in Andrus. The Andrus Barrier Reef stretches for more than 140 miles along the east coast of Andrus. But Andrus is certainly not the only island in the Bahamas with coral reefs. Let's go down south to check out another one. If you know where Inagua is, and if you know where Acklands is, you can find Hogstye Reef. Hogstye Reef is located smack dab between Great Inagua to the south and Acklands to the north. It looks like an atoll, which is a circular reef formation surrounding a lagoon. It's interesting, you know, that an atoll-like reef is found in the Bahamas, since atolls are usually found in volcanic regions. Patch reefs are more common in these parts. Patch reefs are commonly called coral heads and are a defined area of reef surrounded by sand or seagrass. Wait, see that? That's a conch in the seagrass. Oh yeah! Oh no, it's a juvie. This conch is too young to be caught. How do I know? Look carefully. It doesn't have a lip yet. Let's see. Oh, now there's an adult conch. See how thick and flared the lip is? It's legal to take this one. Oh, conch salad time. One adult conch, one exuma onion, some juicy limes, a few goat peppers. Oh, back to the coral reefs. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the coral reefs in the Bahamas are found off our northern and eastern shores or the windward side of our islands. The devil's backbone runs along the northern shore of Eleuthera. Let's go there. Well, or should we go to Abaco? It's Zuma, New Providence, we could take our pick because 95% of the Bahamas is underwater. Boy, that reminds me of what the word Bahamas means. Derived from two Spanish words, Baja meaning shallow and Ma meaning sea. It makes sense that the land of shallow seas would have lots of coral reefs. Now you know where coral reefs are in the Bahamas and around the world. But what exactly is a coral reef? In this case, seeing is understanding. This is a coral reef. Some of these organisms like the damselfish are territorial. They can get defensive, so let's not bother them too much. We should be careful when we are on a reef anyway, because corals are tiny, delicate, fragile animals. Coral animals called polyps secrete a limestone skeleton to protect themselves. This limestone structure provides habitats for organisms in the coral reef ecosystem. Coral polyps usually live in colonies. 
They don't get supplies from England, and I haven't heard of a coral governor, but their colonies work for them. I guess this is because corals seem to have perfected win-win situations better than humans. Let's get closer to this coral. First up, I hope you're ready for this big word that's really not so hard to pronounce when you give it a try. Zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae are a type of microscopic algae that live in the tissues of corals. Because zooxanthellae are plants, they conduct photosynthesis and provide the corals with food and oxygen. So, in exchange for a meal, the corals give the zooxanthellae carbon dioxide and shelter. Seems like a fair arrangement to me. The corals also get their pretty color from these algae living in their tissues. That's why when the zooxanthellae leave, the coral loses its color and appears white. This is called coral bleaching. Now I know you might be wondering, if the zooxanthellae and the coral get along so well together in their neat little symbiotic arrangement, what causes the zooxanthellae to leave the coral? The answer is stress. When the corals get stressed out by changes in their environment like high water temperatures and changes in salinity, the zooxanthellae are expelled. The longer the corals stay stressed, the harder it is for them to reattract the zooxanthellae. With their food producing, color imparting tenants gone, the corals become susceptible to diseases and may eventually die. So, how can you and I help coral reefs before the bleaching process starts? By using less energy, we reduce the amount of fossil fuels burned so that less greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere. This way, we reduce our environmental footprint by decreasing our contribution to global warming. The coral reef is so full of life. Corals fall into two broad categories, soft corals and hard corals. The sea fan is a soft coral. Looks familiar, right? And over here is a sea plume. These soft corals actually move with the water current. And that's how we can distinguish them from hard corals. Sometimes I think of the ocean floor as a dance floor. Oh, if I had some great music right now. <laughs> um, let me see if I can find some examples of hard corals. Oh, here we go. The finger coral, the brain coral, and the staghorn coral are all hard corals. You see this one? This is called the elkhorn coral, and it's an endangered species. We have seen the atoll at Hogsty Reef, and there are many types of corals on this patch reef, but there are also two other types of reefs. Barrier reefs, like the Andrus Barrier Reef, are long, continuous reefs that are far offshore. The fringing reef is the type of coral reef that is very near to the shore. It's probably the one you'll be most likely to see if you spend a day at the beach. Speaking of beach, that's where we come in. A lot of things we do on the earth affect what happens in the sea. So please treat the shore and the ocean with the greatest respect. We've gotten up close and personal with corals, but remember they're not the only organisms living on coral reefs. Let's check out the other plants and animals that make coral reefs so diverse. The producers are so important to any ecosystem because producers, drum roll please, produce. Producers are plants, so they produce food by photosynthesis, thereby starting off the food chain. Microscopic algae like zooxanthellae and phytoplankton Macroalgae, aka seaweed, and seagrasses are all examples of marine producers. They are to the sea what plants are on the land. They make food. Next in line are the herbivores, the animals that eat the algae or seaweed that live on the reef. Now this is important because seaweed competes with corals for space on the reef. Sea urchins and fish like parrotfish, surgeonfish, 
Grasses, angel, and damselfish are all herbivores. Herbivores, like the parrotfish, tend to have small or beak-shaped mouths to feed on the algae. Sometimes their bodies are compressed or flattened sideways like angelfish and this blue tang. This body shape allows them to maneuver in and out of the crevices of the reef in order to find food and to escape from predators. Here's something worthy of mentioning. Parrotfish and wrasses change sex. Yep! They are born female and turn into males later on in their life cycle. The male blue-haired wrasse has a harem. If he dies, then one of the girls becomes a boy and changes features and everything. Carnivores include coralivores like butterfly fish and the top predators. It's the group that usually finds its way on dinner plates in Bahamian homes and restaurants. If you like group of fingers mm, or fried snapper, you like carnivores. When herbivorous fish like parrotfish start turning up on our plates or on restaurant menus, it suggests that the carnivores are not in abundance. Species like Nassau grouper, sea turtles, and sharks are in danger due to overfishing, though in the Bahamas we have laws to protect them. Shark species are in decline globally because they are targeted for their fins. These important predators are the doctors of the ocean. Well, they don't actually go to medical school, but they keep the ocean healthy because they prey on the slower moving, sick and maimed fish. Carnivores, like all organisms, have adaptations that allow them to survive in their environment. Adaptations can be physical features such as color, shape, or the ability to camouflage and behaviors such as burrowing. Nassau grouper, snappers, grunts, and sharks are adapted for hunting. They have large mouths for swallowing prey and are capable of bursts of speed. Many, like dolphins and sharks, have a special color pattern called counter shading. With a dark back and a light belly, they are less visible to prey, both from above and below. Counter shading is pronounced in Nassau grouper, which change color during spawning events. Now, speaking of spawning, closed seasons for Nassau grouper, crawfish, and stone crabs coincide with when they breed. Since they cannot be harvested, this allows them to reproduce and replenish their numbers. This is just one of the ways that we protect marine species in the Bahamas. Detritivores. Now that's a word for the script spelling bee. These organisms feed on detritus, which is the remains of dead plants and animals. Detritivores play an important role in nutrient cycling within an ecosystem. They clean up the reef, but this only involves removing nature's debris from the reef, not our trash. While detritivores are cleaning the coral reefs, omnivores, for example, cleaner fish like these gobies, are cleaning bigger fish. Omnivores eat both plants and animals. They are like the laundromats or car wash depots of the sea. The bigger fish swim up to them and they eat the parasites off of them. In exchange, the bigger fish don't eat the cleaner fish. Seems like a neat arrangement to me. This is like the relationship between corals and zooxanthellae. They are examples of symbiotic relationships in which both organisms benefit. The coral reef is teeming with a great variety of living things, each with an important role. The coral reef is an important marine ecosystem, important for all of us in the Bahamas for many reasons. For one, coral reefs protect our shorelines from erosion because the reef, especially barrier reefs, break waves. Without healthy reefs, loss of beaches and property damage would be greater. Coral reefs also provide many recreational opportunities, both for us locals and for tourists. 
Imagine suiting up and exploring these reefs for yourselves with your family and friends. Just as around 5 million tourists come to the Bahamas each year, some of them for marine sports, and most of them just to lay on the pink sand and soak up the sun. Um, since I mentioned sand, I can't resist telling you that sand in the Bahamas is actually produced by the erosion of plant and animal skeletons, shells, and bits of calcareous organisms. Pink sand gets its color because it includes bits of calcareous organisms called foraminifera, or as I like to call them, forums, which can be pink. Parrotfish scrape algae from rocks with their beak-like mouth as they feed. Any rock that is ingested is then pooped out <laughs> as sand. <laughs> Who would imagine, eh? An adult parrotfish can produce up to a ton of sand each year. This sand is not only important for tourism and recreation, but is also important to the construction industry. Beautiful, healthy reefs drive up our tourism dollars and contribute to a healthy economy. Another benefit to healthy coral reefs is their importance in commercial fishing. In the Bahamas, our number one export is crawfish. That's right. Many Bahamian fishermen make a living catching and selling crawfish. However, without a healthy reef, there won't be a lot of crawfish around to catch. Healthy coral reefs really help our economy in more ways than one, because when fishermen make money, they can spend money, contributing to a robust cash flow in the country. We may not know all of the benefits of coral reefs, and that's another reason why we have to preserve them. With so many undiscovered organisms on the reef, we don't want to lose them before we know just how much they can help us. Coral reefs are an important source of medicines and are currently being used to treat a variety of ailments such as cancer and heart disease. Most marine pollution originates on land. If we leave trash near the shore, it ends up in the ocean and affects the animals and plants living on the reef. What's a Nassau grouper supposed to do with an empty soda can? Or what happens when a turtle accidentally swallows a deadly plastic bag that it mistakes for food? When chemical pollutants like oil, sewage, or fertilizers get into the ocean, they upset the delicate balance of nature by changing the environmental conditions which impact the organisms that live there. It's important to conserve energy. I know you feel you can't live without your MP3 player, laptop, television, cell phone, and video games, but you could conserve energy by unplugging them when they're not in use. What's the connection between your gadgets and little gobies? Well, when power plants burn fossil fuels to give us electricity, one of the greenhouse gases released is carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide warms the air, which then warms the sea, and stresses the coral reefs. Shh! Look at that. It's an alien. I don't mean an alien from outer space. It's a lionfish, an invasive alien species in our waters. An invasive alien species is a non-native species that is harmful to the environment, the economy, or to human health. Lionfish are native to the Indo-Pacific region, but after being introduced into the Western Atlantic, they have spread rapidly throughout the Caribbean region due to their high reproductive rate and the absence of natural predators. They are a threat to the environment because they are voracious feeders, preying on local marine species, posing a threat to the fishing industry. But the good news is, fishermen can catch these lionfish and make them available to us because pointy spines or not, they are delicious. You better start thinking of having lionfish fingers at the chicken shack. <laughs>
Added to the threat of invasive species is the problem of over-harvesting, harvesting of juveniles, or use of harmful fishing practices in our waters. It's a good thing that in the Bahamas we have a number of regulations in place to protect reefs. In addition to the closed seasons that allow carnivores like the Nassau groupers and detritivores like the crawfish to have their babies in peace, there are also size limits. The groupers can only be caught if they are at least three pounds. And crawfish must have at least a five and a half inch long tail. Remember we put that juvenile conch back? Conch must have a well-formed, thick flared lip in order to be harvested. Oh boy, to a fisherman, a thick lip is a beautiful thing. <laughs> In addition to the policies the government has in place to protect the reefs and marine life, there's legislation to protect important species. It is illegal to harvest corals, marine mammals, and turtles, and the commercial fishing of sharks is prohibited. The government has also established a network of marine protected areas which protect marine ecosystems in the Bahamas. These are managed by the Department of Marine Resources and by the Bahamas National Trust. One of the most important conservation initiatives is education. There are many educational activities conducted by BRIEF and other partner agencies, as well as ongoing scientific research. Coral reef surveys, coral nurseries, conch and grouper population studies, and lionfish research and removal activities are ongoing in the Bahamas today. The 2020 challenge is a plan to protect 20% of the marine environment of the Bahamas by the year 2020. Now that's something to think about. Some islands are developing land use plans towards proper zoning and sustainable development. This includes requiring that people do not build too near to the shore or clear-cut land which causes the curry to run off into the ocean. Proper land use plans also make the necessary provisions for solid waste and sewage disposal. We're doing a lot in the Bahamas to protect our precious marine resources. But there's so much more that we can do with proper planning and good environmental stewardship. We owe it to the corals, Nassau grouper, Queen conch, crawfish, the damselfish with all their attitude, and to all of the others. They can't swim up on shore and hold a conference and advocate for themselves. They need us, and certainly we need them. I really enjoyed being your tour guide today. Until the next time we meet on a coral reef, be good to yourself, with others agree. Be good to the land, sky, and sea. Protect the jewels in the sunlit ground.